like a man. Be a man. Be a man. For my kids, I was gonna end this hyper-masculine narrative here. So good morning everybody, I'm Saran Dixon. As Michelle said, I'm the uh, Chief Executive and Founder of Diversity Role Models. That is a Kiwi accent you can hear. Unless I say anything offensive, I am 100% Australian. <laughs> so Diversity Role Models was set up in 2011 uh, after the suicide of this young man here. Dominic Crouch was 15 years old and in 2010 he left his school one lunchtime he climbed on top of a five-story car park building and he jumped off. And he did that after he had played a game of uh, Dear Truth or Promise um, with some other children. And he had been dared to kiss another boy, which he did, didn't think much of it. Photos were taken, sent around the school. He was called gay and he decided that he would rather die than be called gay. His parents don't even think he was gay. And we launched in the House of Commons in 2011 and Roger Crouch, you can see in that photo, um, spoke very movingly at the launch and tragically a month later he took his own life because he couldn't cope with what he'd had to live through with his own son. So I often say that was a family of more than likely entirely heterosexual people cut in half due to homophobia. I'm not going to read through these statistics because you probably have seen a lot of them in the headlines. What I am going to do is read you a quote from uh, a young student. It's not what they say to me individually that gets at me. It's the constant stream of anti-gay remarks that people don't even know they make. It eats away inside you, and sometimes knowing what they'd do to me if they knew makes me lose the ability to breathe. And if she hasn't got the ability to breathe, how does she have the ability to study or to express herself and to do what she's good at, to be happy? What we do is go into schools, primary and secondary, and we tell honest stories. It's very difficult to hold on to your prejudices when you're faced with somebody from that minority group against which you hold your prejudices, and they're talking to you honestly and openly. I watched uh, one of our transgender role models speak recently, uh, Tori, and she was telling young people about um, how her dad used to beat her, initially to beat the gay out of her, and then when, when she was uh, perceived as male, and then to beat the trans out of her. Uh, and there, there's a lot of young people crying in that room because it's very hard to hold on to your emotion when you're listening to stories like that. And the hardest kid, the one that probably does join in some of the aggression, the banter, that's the pebble in the pond bit. Those, that's where we want to raise a question in their mind. Do I really want to join in with this? I actually quite like that person. And so we start the ball rolling with that. And that, that quote there, that's really key, is that there's a young person who said, we've, we've talked about this concept of homosexuality a lot. But these were some real people talking to us, and it has such an impact when we're real. I'm not going to talk too much about DRM. Please do go on our website and look at, about, at the work that we do um, if you want to learn more. But I want to get into something deeper that I've discovered in my work as a teacher and leading this organisation. I think that most examples of homophobia, when unpeeled, are actually sexism or misogyny in disguise. Now allow me to demonstrate. When I first went into a school, when I was coming up with the idea for diversity role models, and I went to a school to tell, talk to young people, and I said, this, you know, it was really vague the way I did it at the time, saying, what do you think of gay people? And that's disgusting, yuck, yuck, yuck. Did all of that posturing of heterosexuality and masculinity from the boys. And, and, uh, and then I, you know, partway through the lesson, I said, by the way, I'm gay. And they went, oh! And one of the boys got up and moved away from me. And uh, there was a whole discussion around why he'd done that. He thought it was contagious. Some of the kids thought I must have AIDS. I mean, it was really, and this is in London, so this is in our thriving um, metropolis of acceptance here. So um, we did a lot of work with them there. But one of the things that struck me was that the boys were saying, well, you're fine because you're a woman. But if you're a man, we'd knock you out. So then I was thinking, right, I need men beside me, right? And the same thing happened when I went into schools and we were talking about, um, it would have some Muslim kids saying, yeah, but you're white folks, not for us. So I thought I need some Muslim role models and then I need some disabled role models and there's diversity in, in our role modeling. So I had that response thinking, okay, so there's a real response here from boys. The girls weren't particularly interested. They were kind of fine with it. Go into that a little bit further and we get, it's what they do, Mrs. it's disgusting. And this isn't, to be fair, this isn't what our workshops do now because we're very curriculum-based, but back then when I was teaching sex and relationships <laughs> education, that's my disclaimer, um, they, you know, what, it's what they do, it's disgusting. And let's be honest, they're talking about anal sex, right? So I'd say, say to them, you know that heterosexual people also um, 
have anal sex, and it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, it's what they do. And then you get this, I don't mind the one that does it. Now that to me demonstrates that it's not about homosexuality, because they don't have an issue with women, particularly good-looking women that they see on porn. They're good, right? Not, they're not too happy with butch-looking women that look like men usurping the place of man. This is a hierarchy of male to female we're talking about here. They don't mind the one that does it, because he's still being masculine. They mind the one that takes the place of woman and is penetrated. And that's what it comes down to. And I've never seen it more clearly demonstrated than when I speak to young people because gay equals girl and girl equals less than. And you can see this in nurseries and primary schools where we start to see young boys saying, you don't touch that, we don't touch pink things, we don't touch handbags, we don't touch aprons, because they know that it's feminine and feminine things are less than. And they learn that very, very early on. So we know what gender constructs are about being fragile, passive. We know the sort of toys that girls are given, the pink things. But what are the effects of this on girls? And withdrawing from sport, I could talk about that for half an hour, and the effects on the NHS and women in this country because they don't participate in sport. Look at sports fields on a Saturday morning and see that 95% of those sports fields are filled with men. I stopped playing. I stopped doing swimming when I was, I was a very good swimmer when I was about 10. I stopped swimming because my shoulders were too broad, and I figured that was a boy thing, a manly thing to have. I'm stuck with them anyway, unfortunately, but um, I, I pulled out of sport because of that at that age, and I was a very confident child. Speaking up less in class, we know that this also happens in the workplace and in the boardroom. Lowering of aspirations in the face of boys. Girls shrink. That's that bottom term there. It's the best thing I can think of to describe it is that when I speak to young women and say, what is it you know, that you're aspiring to do? When they're in a girls-only environment, they do aspire. When there's boys around, they stop, they shrink. One of the things I've noticed in the schools I've been into is that the space is taken up by the boys. And that's fine, it's not the boys' fault, but it's not managed well. So 80% of the space is boys playing football out in the, in the schoolyard. And I often hear girls saying, the boys dominate, we don't really have much room. And again, this isn't the fault of the boys, it just isn't being managed carefully. So girls don't feel they have the room to aspire, to be bigger. Boys aren't allowed to express themselves, they're allowed to aspire, they can't express, they're very enclosed. And for boys, this top statistic here, suicide is the biggest killer of 20 to 34 year old males in this country. The biggest killer. Now that is a huge problem. What are we doing wrong? That video there, it's, you know, it's American culture, but it's very similar to what happens here. And some of this might sound a bit negative because I'm sitting in a room full of people who are fully on board and the work that Accenture does is absolutely fantastic and you should all be extremely proud to be role modeling what you role model. However, I'm worried about what happens in schools and I can't say that I think it's getting better. Some of the boys, um, Afro-Caribbean boys in a particular study, didn't want to apply themselves academically because it looks gay. It's, again, blatant homophobia in action. Homophobia is the tool that enforces gender constructs. Drink and violence. When we have societies that are, where men are disengaged and don't feel able to perform, and, and we notice girls are often doing better academically now, and let's say they did step into all the leadership roles that were available to them. What happens to the men? The one thing they still have is strength and the availability of alcohol. And in societies where things have really gone downhill, that's where we see a, a significant amount of violence against women um, and against other men. And involvement in rites of passage activities, this has been going on for generations. However, one thing has changed, and I'm going to come back to that very soon. It's the impact of pornography on society. I'm not going to, I just want you to think about this while I'm talking, but things that you might have heard um, in your day-to-day -day work, at home, um, it, on TV shows, that reinforce the gender constructs I've just been talking about there. But one of the things I've heard as a teacher often is teachers saying, could I have two strong boys to carry that bench, please? And I think the girls have got muscles that are attached to bones, they work as levers, they're just the same, they can carry benches. But we do that construction. Teachers don't have any unconscious bias training. So they are constructing gender for us all day, every day. And I had a, an example of a, I've got a six-month-old son, and um, the antenatal group that I go to where you're forced together with all these people you have nothing in common with except you're pregnant at the same time. <laughs> um, one of the girls came to me and said, oh, my husband um, really wants to take Sonny to the park to teach him football. 
And obviously I saw red because um, they've got a little girl called Florence. And I said, why don't you tell Grant to take Florence to the park and teach her football? And why don't you tell Grant that I can run a 10K in 36 minutes? When he can beat me in a race, he can take my son to the park to teach him football. <laughs> But these are the sort of things you hear all the time, and we're doing that with babies. With six-month-old babies, we are telling them what they can and can't do, treating them in different ways. The ticking time bomb is pornography, to me. I've got significant concerns about the impact of pornography on our young people. And this is probably something you didn't think you were going to hear about today. <laughs> Coming to work at Accenture, <laughs> a lineup. I would say put your hand up if you know what a lineup is, but you probably wouldn't admit to it. Um, a lineup is when a group of boys stand in a row and a girl performs oral sex on them. This happens in our school grounds. It's the new behind the bike sheds. We used to smoke or kiss and things like that. It was fairly tame in comparison to what happens now. The, and this idea about um, oral, oral sex is a one-way street. This is what's shocking when you talk to young people. If you ask girls if it would go the other way, they'd be like, oh, that's disgusting. And so would boys say the same thing. So feminism's gone back a long way when it comes to young people and sexuality in this country. The close shave, if you ever talk to young women, and we do, not that we, I, we do this with diversity role models, but if we're ever doing work around sexuality or if I've done it as a teacher, talking to them about, about pubic hair, they don't know what it is, they think it's disgusting. If you show boys a load of photos of vaginas and no one has pubic hair on, what's that, what's wrong with her? They don't know what it is because the access to pornography is significant. And so they don't know what real bodies look like anymore. And if you think of the way that women are treated in pornography, there's a lack of consent. Only a third of young people even know what consent is. Uh, and there's a total lack of enjoyment. So these things that we don't talk about with young people, we don't have compulsory sex and relationships educations in this country. Um, and that's a, that's a real concern to me. One of the um, quotes from a boy uh, around this said, if you were shown a photo of a girl naked and you told them that's wrong, they will straight away say that you're gay. Homophobia is the tool that reinforces gender constructs. And again, there's just an attrition of values, an attrition of what it means to be male and what it means to be female. And I'm telling you this because these are your next generation of employees. These are your children that will be exposed to some of this. And we live in a pocket, in a bubble, and we hope that our children won't be involved in things like this, and more than likely they won't be. However, they're around people that are. We know what the issues are. I'm not going to read those to you, but I keep wondering how we're not going to be sitting here in 50 years, or well, we won't be, we'll be skeletal if we were, but how will the next generation not be sitting here having exactly the same conferences and asking the same questions if we do not address what is happening in our nurseries, our primary schools, and our secondary schools? Because that is where gender is set up. That is where women are set up to not aspire, but to express, where men are set up to aspire, uh, to aspire and, uh, have I mixed that up? You get what I mean. Um, <laughs> So that's, I'm, I'm, that's why I bring these questions to you. Very quickly, these are the things that play with our heads a little bit. Beyond gender, trans men can give birth. It doesn't happen very often, but if you were born with a uterus and working ovaries, fallopian tubes, you can give birth. And while when gender lines start to blur a little more, we might see a little bit more of this going on. An interesting response I get to transgender women being lesbians is often young people and even adults will say, well, why didn't you just stay a man then if you're attracted to women? And they're not getting that gender identity is very, very different and often unrelated to sexual orientation at all. The A to Z categorization of gender. I've often thought how we are really simple. It seems somewhat unintelligent in a way to just give ourselves male and female, these two ideas, when actually gender, if you thought of it as an A to Z spectrum, on one particular day, you might be a D. Like, I love going to black tie dinners, dressing up, heels, makeup, and everything else, but I also love play, doing cross country or playing football where I'm covered in mud, and I might be way further down the spectrum. Um, on, on that particular day, but you put me in a different culture with a different class, put me in New Zealand, where everyone's playing sport, then I would look particularly feminine in my tracksuit, probably. It's a real, it's a cultural thing. And for all of us, if we start to think about gender in a different way on different days, we realize that the way we're doing it is very limiting to our children and, and young people as they're growing up, and perhaps to our employees, if we're only looking at these two options. And I like to think of um, Google, the search engine, as the way it picks up information about us. 
it sees, it looks at the things we search for, it sees us as patchwork human beings, and we're all patchwork human beings. We're not just male or female or a particular ethnicity, sexual orientation or faith, the five or six categories we look at. We're patchwork, and that's fantastic. And if we could look at all human beings like that, it would make our lives so much richer. Lastly, all of us can do something about this. Whether it's the pebble in the pond and just refraining from using particular language or joining in the banter, or you're a propeller in the pond, you work with charities like Diversity Role Models who challenge some of these constructs, or lastly, you kind of lean in and lean out, and I think it's fantastic that you're talking about he for she and she for he, because these aren't female issues, they're not male issues, they're human issues. And if you can imagine classrooms where young people go to school where they're not strong little boys and pretty little girls, but they're human beings who are allowed to express, to develop their talents, who have role models, who are presenting lots of different characteristics, and those young people grow up and come and work at Accenture, where you have a 50-50 split of gender on the, on a board, in a boardroom, and you see men taking parental leave, and you see everybody bringing their true, authentic selves to work. Only this way, if we're all taking responsibility for this, will we see huge change. Have we got any time for questions? Because I think I've probably just about hit my limit. Yeah, uh, I think we, we, don't, we don't really have much time to throw out, but I do want to ask you one thing, thing yeah. which, is, um, which is really what you would advise Accenture to, to do. For example, they've already moved from accent on women to accent on gender, but mm. I'm conscious of what you said about you know, the link between homophobia and mm. sexism. Do you think, for example, that accent on LGBT ought to be part of accent on gender? Uh, not essentially, because I think the, the work that you do around LGBT is also incredibly yeah. important, and sometimes we um, dilute things if we put them mm. together. Um, I, th I think c collaboration between networks is really, really important. But I think what's great about Accenture is the work you're doing is quite uh, groundbreaking. What you do is role model for other organisations, put your, your heads above the parapet. And what you probably don't realise is that what organisations like Accenture do is role model for schools, because schools are now being run more like businesses. So every time you take a step forward, you're taking a step forward for schools, because the head teachers will be watching and realising it, it makes business sense to do the work that you're doing. And schools didn't used to think like that. So it's really important that you know that you, what you're doing doesn't just impact you, it's really having a significant impact on society, and I really do congratulate you for that. And also, you know, all of these people, they, they have a very influential role when it comes to their clients. They mm. see lots of different industries. You know, they're often with their clients mm. at a point of tremendous change. So would you encourage them to think as widely as possible? You know, what does, it, what does gender really mean today? Or what does diversity really mean today? Oh, definitely. That bit there about applying equality drivers to your business strategy. I mean, I know that you do that anyway. But if you take that into the thread of your everyday life and working with all of your clients, I mean, I wouldn't advise talking to them about lineups, but if you are, <laughs> if you, unless they're that kind of client. But if, you are, if you're educating people everywhere you go, everywhere you go about this, refraining, challenging. We need to um, connect with others who aren't like us and then challenge together, and that is exactly what He for She and She for He is all about. Okay, thank you so much for everything you've mm -hmm. shared. Thank you, Saran Dixon. The next discussion is going to be much more practical about translating um, you know, ideas